For this year's UN Anti-Racism Day, I'll be asking Dr. Joanna Abayi, MBE, founder of Blue Moon, some questions about how to be anti-racist. Okay, so let's fire in with question one, Joanna. What does it mean to be anti-racist and how is that different from just being not racist? So for me, anti-racism is essentially challenging any process or behaviour that isn't being anti-racist, essentially, and that's how you're anti-racist. So I don't think it's, any, it's, it's okay or enough anymore to say I'm, no, I'm not racist. I think there's one thing not being racist and then there's one thing challenging the structures that keep racism in place. So I think Ibram X. Kendi uh, speaks about this really, really well in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. But essentially, if we take it in the context of the workplace, if you know there are systems in place that provide inequity uh, to particular groups, in, in, in this instance, to uh, black people, and you're not doing anything to challenge that or to stop that, then it's, you can you know you can say you're not racist because you're not actively going out there and being racist but you're not actively being anti-racist either so you're almost by in in some instances almost a little bit complicit in this systemic um consistent inequity because you're not doing enough to challenge that so so that's how i would best i would best describe it so it lies almost on a scale really doesn't it it's not one or the other it's, mm -hmm. and, and everybody's aiming to be closer towards the anti-racism end of this scale. Absolutely. And of course, that's not, to, you know, of course, I think as well, we've got to kind of think about it in the context of, you know, if you saw, if you suddenly say, you know, I'm not racist, you're kind of a bit like, well done, you know, great. <laughs> and that, and of course, but, but you'd hope from a sort of moral perspective that you wouldn't be racist, right? Yeah. But that it, I think there's more when it comes to, it's, it's more significant when you're challenging the things that are keeping that racism in place. Um, and I, I think if you are not someone who is black, um, being a, an ally for those individuals who are being um, oppressed by some of those structures, some of those behaviors, some of those policies, um, then, then, then the best way actually to be that ally is to constantly turn some of those policies, processes, behaviors, on their head um, and, and that's how I think you can actively be anti-racist. So can you be anti-racist without being a protester in the streets? Absolutely, absolutely and, and, and I can give you some some examples. Um, anecdotally this has been shared with me a couple of times from, from men uh, who are black and um, they've sort of shared this there's this incident that happens quite regularly on the tubes so sometimes there'll be an empty, there'll be a full carriage. Uh, the, the, the black man will be sat down on a chair. The only free seat is the one next to him. And he always it will explain how often people will not take that seat next to him, even though it's the available seat. And that's because um, there, is a, there is a fear and intimidation about, which is still out there from the, the narratives that we've seen over many, many years, an intimidation about sitting that close to a black male, whether you are a female or, or not. And so that person will, would rather stand for 10 stops, you know, uh, on a particular line than sit next to that person. Now that's happened many times and, uh, for this gentleman. Um, and on one, one occasion, um, what happened was the, there was a, a lady who was sat opposite the gentleman on the train and she watched this person come on, see how crammed this train was and still not, and see the seat, eye up the seat, and then not sit, and not sit, on, sit uh, on that seat. And so when she acknowledged that this was a, and something that was playing out, she got up from her seat and sat next to the black gentleman. And she didn't have to say anything, but that was her saying, I'm, I'm anti this, I don't support this. And I'm gonna. It's a small. It's a small act, but I'm gonna sit next to you, in a in a in um if you like in an act of solidarity. That there's absolutely no reason why we can't take the seat next to you. Um, I'm gonna challenge. I'm gonna challenge the racism that's happening here. And in the instance, this was a white uh, female, and so again, it's using the privilege that she has of not having some of those stereotypes to contend with, 
not having those biases to contend with she then says actually i'm going to use that to challenge the, the dynamic that's going on here so again subtle no noise made but again being an ally and being anti a behavior that was oppressing a particular individual now that's just an anecdotal um experience has been shared with me many times by a number of different black men um in another instance um for example you can be in a room uh an, a room of all white people you could hear a comment that is made uh that is probably racist definitely racist and in the context that there's not any um black person present so there's no gratitude there will be no praise uh you would say i don't i think that's incredibly inappropriate and racist and i don't want to hear that in this room ever again now that is a way of calling out a behavior um when there is no reward or, or, grat or gratification for doing it in that moment other than the fact that what you said was racist and i can sit here and not say anything because i know i'm not racist or i can challenge the fact that that language and behavior is being used in this context by calling it out and actively challenging it and what what do you what do you do when you are when you're pushed back on something like that for example I think, I think it happens all the time. I think, yeah, you're absolutely a really good question. I think it happens all the time. I think you reiterate the point. And I think you stand confident in the, in the observation that you've made. And if that person obviously explains perhaps where that came from or a lack of education or a lack of understanding about uh, how offensive that might have been, for example, then you can just educate them further. But I don't think you back down in that moment. I think there are different ways in which to call out behaviour. So I'm not suggesting that you... Um, embarrass someone and, and the only reason why I'm saying I'm not suggesting that is because I know that's something people are worried about being in a context where they want to call something out but for fear of a bigger situation happening and it could be their manager it could be a key stakeholder that's a part you know that has influence in their in their career or life in some way uh, what I'm suggesting though is that you can still call that out without creating a confrontational uh, and what you might think uh, threatening to your position and role uh, situation. So I think you stand confident and firm in, in what you've observed. And if, if, it's, if it's something that they want to explain, absolutely. But your, you know, once, something, once an action leaves you, how it's received, unfortunately, you no longer have control over. So if that's some observation that that person has, it's valid and therefore needs to be considered. Thanks, Joanna. Um, moving on to the next point then, a lot of white people feel you know in the wake of everything that happened last year with black lives matter movement and the um murder of george floyd a lot of black people uh, excuse me a lot of white people feel vilified and almost left out of this movement why is that um i think it's look it's interesting isn't it i'm i'm of mixed heritage so you know i have a white mum a black dad uh, some of the experiences that I've faced on my dad's face, my mum just hasn't experienced. Um, so there is going to be, a, as much as there will be an empathy and an understanding and an education that, that she would be prepared to do or would have witnessed herself through, you know, marrying someone in the 80s and meeting them in the 70s, I'm sure she's very aware of how things have changed and the way their relationship would have been received. But I think there is still something in that you know, she she wouldn't have been in con particular context in which perhaps my dad or us as siblings as her children would have been in and, um, and received um, particular stereotypes. That is not to say she didn't experience other stereotypes, but they wouldn't have been necessarily related um, to being black or brown, right? So that's an experience unique to us. So I think that sometimes when it feels like an experience that you don't live and breathe every day, one, you challenge whether it exists. So you go, are you sure? Like we're such a liberal country or, you know, we're such a tolerant society in, you know, here. So are you sure that that's what it was? And so if it's not something that's deeply, you know, not directly impacting you, you can constantly have that challenge of whether it exists. I don't think white people should feel vilified. I think no one is taking away from the experiences that anybody else, anybody else goes through, whether you are a white person, a disabled person, a gay person, um, a Muslim, a Jewish person, those are all your lived experiences. I just think in the instance when we're talking about race and ethnicity, um, 
and the Black Lives Matter movement, that was the black uh, community explaining and educating people on the experiences that they have. And I think when we, the only time that this, this, this um, I think vulnerability exposes itself in, in all the 14 years that I've been doing this always is around race. If I was to talk, you know, if they were to talk about um, accessibility and some of the challenges that people with disabilities have, whether they're visible or non-visible, I've not seen this response. And I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but this response where um, I've, I've never experienced in any of my workshops or any of my career an able-bodied person say, for example, what about us? I, I've never, that's, I've never heard that. I, I've heard, I've, I've, and I'm not taking away if there are, disabled people that have experienced that, but I'm just suggesting that I have uh, seen more empathy. I don't, I don't see that, I don't see that um, debate, whereas it gets very sensitive around um, race and ethnicity, where when we, when we suddenly talk about that, it becomes, but what about, but what about, and it's, it's immediately defensive. No one is taking away from the experience that you, that you have had, whether it's as a working class person, as a female, and as, uh, as any other identifying characteristic that you have, what we're trying to explain is this is what's happening to black people mm. and, and Asian people around the world who are and other minority ethnic individuals. And, and we're trying to tell you that it's unacceptable and, and it needs to stop. So I think don't feel vilified. I think there are terms like white privilege, which can come across as and white fragility, which can come across as um, confrontational and finger pointing and triggering and actually really i would always i would really implore people to to go away and to <laughs> to to educate themselves on what those terms really really mean when mm -hmm. they're talking about white privilege they're not suggesting that your life has been privileged it's not a, it's not a debate on your hardships or your life experiences it's explaining that you your life is absent of the experiences of the of people with black or brown skin and, and I'm, I'm only using the word brown there because often when we use that an acronym, B-A-M-E, there's lots of people that don't feel the A actually represents them, right? So that, that's the reason why I'm, I'm using that. But I think there's two things there, aren't there, Joanna? Because there's this, the, I think the thing that's triggering about terms like you said, like white privilege um, and white fragility is that I think what possibly people, and this is my conjecture, find difficult is the fact that something that they... Have, may not have contributed to, may even be very anti, is attached to them automatically without them having done anything to contribute to it. And I think that's why possibly it can be kind of triggering and, and accusatory almost. Um, but I, I feel perhaps that it's, it's, it's language is just something we use to identify what yeah. the thing is, and that's all it is in this situation. It's, it's not, you know, pointing a finger at anybody in particular or anything like that. Absolutely, and, and listen, like, if we go back, you know, historically, myself as a mixed race black woman has have privileges, you, you, you know, and and so I totally understand that 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 feeling of. So am I? Have I? You you I feel and I and I've spent my whole life um, challenging inequity and inequality. So that but then I'm told, but you have this privilege, and you know, and so I could take it as, hang on a minute, you know, I've done. X, Y, and Z to challenge these things. But I think it's just the understanding. It's not really about necessarily um, the contribution that you've made. It's not a question of that. It's, it's and absolutely to your point about it being accusatory. It's more about the way the world sees you. Um, so, so it's not about, it's not that, you know, your kind of um, black peers, colleagues, friends, family members don't see what you do to be anti-racist. Of course they do. They're just explaining and they're not accusing you um, of, of, of creating the systems that are in place for you personally. They're not holding you personally account for that. They're just suggesting that the way the world sees you is different to the way that we are seen. And therefore there is a privilege that comes with that in the same way that there is a privilege that people experience, for example, if they are heterosexual over homosexual in an environment where people are biased towards that. So it's, it's just trying to explain that context really. Yeah, and I think the important thing because you know you hear so often that these conversations are so hard the thing that makes it hard is when we bring our pride to these conversations yeah. what we actually need to bring is our humility um and our and our willingness to hear and to understand and to know that it's not necessarily uh, aimed at any one individual but the structures and the systems in society that we all live in um that are there 
you know, regardless of what that we're born into, none of us can do anything and about. I, yeah, and I think that's where that um, the term white fragility comes in, which is equally um, quite difficult, I think, for for uh, for some white people to kind of to deal with. And I know the book by Robin DiAngelo's had co quite kind of mixed reviews on some of this. But what I would say on that, for example, is that the easiest way for me to to kind of break that down is. Um, sometimes in any situation you in any relationship you have you might be telling someone how you feel about something and what you need in that moment is people to use their two ears and mouth and in that proportion so listen before they kind of before they before they before they respond and speak and in that moment I guess what you're asking for in it whether it's your friend your colleague is hear what I'm saying listen yeah. to understand me don't listen to respond and and once we've kind of gone through what I'm explaining by all means we can talk about the experience you've had too but please don't take away and dismiss my feeling a bit because you are too busy defending defending it and that's what we, we mean when we say fragility sometimes what you're going to hear is is going to be so uncomfortable it could even be when you get feedback at work and you're like oh I can't hear that I did this really badly so you defend immediately and you know because it's a you're, you're feeling fragile about the what you're about to uh, here and, and and so just think about it like that when we're saying white white fragility we're talking about the fact that when a black person tries to explain these inequities to a white person sometimes because it is such a hard pill to swallow if you like you you respond with defense and yeah. actually they're just asking you just listen to this and we can then we can also hear your views but please listen to understand me at least yeah. So it pertains to structure rather than individual. When we use that term white fragility, white, um, you know, it, it's it's the structure rather than you. I'm talking about you as an individual, yeah. as a white individual. It's it's the structure of whiteness within a racist society. Yeah. In light of this, what's a good way to frame these conversations to kind of kick them up or start them? Um, if you if you really want to kind of be an ally to this and, and you want to learn. I think it's important to do sort of private education. I've, um, you know, I think it's it's really important to, to do that. I, I'll give you an example. Like someone in my personal life had um, had quite a uh, tough experience and it was something that I wanted to be able to understand and support so rather than get them to keep living through the trauma of explaining what their life was like you know going through this experience I just went off and did the research myself and then uh, I even googled things like I know, I know it sounds silly but what not to ask someone who's dealing with um, you know so I went on blogs and, and people that had written about these things with lived experience so so that I could I was in the best position possible to support because that's what I wanted to do. So I think there is a, there is something in going away and like when you know when you hear about something, just doing a little bit of a, a kind of there. Google search or a re get, grab a book or go to the library. You know, get something from maybe the library you can't do it at the moment, but you know, go and go and get something that you can listen to to educate yourself, so that when you actually do um, have conversations like this you you are already coming from a place of education I yeah. don't think as well that people mind being asked a question so for example um one of the things I do is I run book clubs and to talk about particular things not just race but about lots of things you know um intersectional matters like you know being from a particular faith and also gay for example so I run book clubs that, that include books that would have addressed some of these things and told some of these anecdotal stories and the reason we do that is then you can then come to a, a, a conversation having had a read of something maybe even as a result of reading that gone off and YouTube something or googled something else and then you're able to go, I've read this book, and I think people are, are, are less, um, like they're happy to answer questions where there's confusion, if it would help to, you know, to clarify. I think what they don't want to have to do is, is educate you, you know, from the outset. But where if you've gone off and done something independently, and then you just have a, a question you haven't quite been able to work out, or you've seen lots of conflicting thoughts on online, then you might want to ask the person that you feel safe to do that with. Yeah. And just caveat that with, I have read this book or I have watched this program. I was listening to this podcast and I just found some of these things quite conflicting. And this is how I feel. Is that is that offensive? Is that not being anti-racist? Is, you know, and it's kind of. This is what I've heard. This mm. is what 
these are the these are the opinions that I've heard on this subject. What what's your take on it? Because I know you have a lot of experience mm. of kind of thing. No, yeah, and I think framing it in that way, people are not um, they won't be they're not offended by that. I think that's an open conversation that people are happy to have. I just think also though, just be mindful that depending on how many people may have asked that question during that period. So certainly around the time of the protests and the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that we saw happen in the US. I think around that time, it was heavy. Yeah, It was a heavy time for people. It was a traumatic time for people. So even if you had done that research and you'd have asked in the most sort of polite and open way, just be mindful that at that within that context, there was a lot going on for some for individuals, specifically black people. And so some of that may have felt a bit much and for their own well-being, maybe they needed to take a step back. But certainly there will be other places in which you can absolutely go to there's organizations like mine and others and I'm sure as you say the MU that facilitated conversations like this that can provide a context where people are happy to to have that that conversation so just be mindful that it's not an, a, re, a rejection of your question forever just be, bear in mind the context in which people would have been in at the time that you may have been asking that um I, I also think there is there's there's something in um creating a way to distance your personal views um from a from a subject especially if it's someone that you really care about so you know I, I facilitated a number of conversations which have included people that have worked with each other for 20 years um who've never talked about race um who've never discussed it and 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 then something like black lives matter protests happen and what we see happens with Breonna and George Floyd and you suddenly go goodness me I've never actually spoken to my black best friend about this um, because they've just always been my best friend, which was always the kind of um, thing that people would say, I, I, we just get on, we just love each other. I've not had to have that conversation. And then suddenly this happens and you go, I probably should ask that as a friend, I should probably try and support. And then you're like, how do I broach this? And this could be a friendship ending conversation if I do not um, approach this in the right way. And I've seen that, unfortunately, I've seen that happen. People have lost friendships through this. Um, and so I think kind of having something that distances you uh, by sort of saying I know we've never had this conversation before um, and I've, I think we've never had it because of x do you agree you know what why do you think we've never had it so allow them to say we've never had it because I think you you put across, possibly might have felt defensive I feel like you know let them say why they think they also haven't had it so you both let them say well I have done some reading I did watch this show or I listened to this debate and these are some of the thoughts I had and questions I had um, based on what I've heard or based on what I've read or based on what I've watched I'd really like to talk to you about it but the last thing I'm trying to do in here in this moment of educating myself is one make you feel further othered or feel that trauma or really of any other burden that you you feel um, and the last thing I want to do is hurt you or offend you I'm doing this to understand and experience that i can't possibly understand in the way that you do and I think if you're that upfront and say I might say something wrong I might say something terribly wrong, but that is not what my intention is here. My Bring your humility. Is, yeah, and my intention here is to purely understand and, and support you and be anti whatever you need me to be in order to support you. And I think once you put that caveat out there, I think it's okay. Like when I've, when I've had conversations, I've said, okay, think that everything you're going to say is going to offend me and I still won't be offended. Now yes. talk. <laughs> and I think the other thing as well is to know that, you know, all black people aren't going to be necessarily singing from the same hymn yeah. sheet on on this subject because we've all had different experiences our lived experiences are entirely different so we'll all have slightly different opinions and no one person can a fix it or b has this you know the same mindset in how to approach it or what their experiences of 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 approaching it or you know how how it's affected them so i think that's another really important thing to to recognize when you approach you know if you've got a, a friend that you've talked to who has a particular opinion that then doesn't blanket over um, the entire yeah. issue. um and i think that's really important to, yeah no to i think you make a really good point there linton that's so true because sometimes i think that there's a bigger burden that you kind of especially if you're in a meeting as you probably are in many meetings with the work that you do and certainly I would imagine in your broadcasting career where you kind of being asked a question you're like this is my view yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> or, this was what I read in Robin's book you know yes. rather than like I'm talking for any everyone and, a, and, a, and anyone black I'm, I'm talking yes. from you know 
um it's almost a bit like those disclaimers you see on twitter views are just my own yeah, <laughs> they're, not, exactly. they're not the experience of everybody here yeah. there are some there are some and i think that's important isn't it the things to distinguish are there are some factual things to do with uh racial relations um yeah. and then there are some things that stem are anecdotal to yourself yeah, yeah, precisely yeah. and i think that's where um, when you're educating yourself is being able to draw between those two, uh, distinguish what, what is factual, what we're dealing with, which is systemic racism, things that structures that are in place, um, which maintain oppression and, and you know, um, lived opinion that affects somebody's um, thought process on either how to deal with it or how they how it's affected them. And that leads quite nicely into my next question, which is, you know, you see a lot of people of colour getting quite frustrated um, or they might be triggered by something. And and, um, you know, I've, I've faced that dealing with people of other minorities mm. uh, and I, I've, I've suddenly been taken aback by that. What's a what's a good approach if, if something you've said um you know has has triggered somebody um i think i think there's two there's two things i think um quite often it will feel like an overreaction because you it, this term microaggression has been flying around right uh, which references these kind of unintentional um things that happen or are said and i think the reason people get taken aback sometimes one of the reasons why people get taken aback is because you can suddenly think goodness me I didn't I didn't mean it like that I just said it um in this meeting I was you know sorry I was clunky I just but I think why it can be it, it can feel loaded is you're not the only person that just said it or didn't mean it that way or it wasn't intentional or oh, I didn't know that wasn't the right word or I didn't know that wasn't the right language sometimes they're not micro at all they feel very macro <laughs> you feel othered in every day of your life right so uh, so I think just be mindful that for what, what what might be micro to you could be something that person's dealt with every single day all day for the past 50 years and they get to a point where they're like i'm sitting in this room i feel like you should know better i'm frustrated today yeah and i think you've got to give people the the idea that you or, or understand that they are um they are what's the word i'm looking for they are um allowed to feel upset by something they experience if somebody feels something they are they it's valid to them their feelings yeah? are valid absolutely their feelings are valid so it's not for us to tell them how they tell us it how they react to it how they respond to it these things are emotional they're hard they're difficult um so and especially if it's not just micro so while i understand it can take someone aback and it can feel quite confrontational and it can make you feel really nervous it can make you feel exposed and vulnerable in in you know in particular situations just understand where that where their heaviness comes from yeah it's not my it's, in that moment. yeah it's really important to say as well you know if you do get a reaction like that um as somebody who has not had that experience that that humility i keep saying that word but you have to bring to that situation that that level of understanding because what we're dealing with is something really quite sensitive you know um so if something you do say does trigger somebody you know muster all the sensitivity and humility you can to deal with that situation and don't necessarily expect from the 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 person who's who's had to deal with that because you don't know like you said how much they've had to deal with it you know don't expect them to suddenly want to be calm because like you said it could be the 10th time that day that they've had to deal with not necessarily a similar microaggression but another microaggression that has just built 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 and it, and it's resulted in that and and we're all human and we all you know we all react and of course reactions have yeah. consequences but you know yeah what one has to bring i think is that extra sensitivity to the the subject and I, and I and I think in the same way that we've said their feelings are valid, your feelings are valid too, to feel hurt or affronted by something that's happened and been said to you. And so I'm not saying by any stretch that that there's there isn't a place for you to take up the way that that was maybe addressed. But I think maybe in that moment, uh, listen, um, apologize if it's obvious that what you've said is as offended and, and explain your intention wasn't to do that and then I think when things are calmer and cooler uh take some time to actually go and sit down with that person and explain while I you know I understand that this is something you're experiencing 
it just wasn't my intention and just get back to that playing that level and ground understand as well take yeah. the time to understand where that yeah. came from as well as explain where you came from. i think understand first and then explain absolutely and, and give allow the space for the conversation essentially you know allow there to be space for us to both explain and as i say always 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 listen with your two ears and speak so you listen with two ears which means you use them in that proportion listen first and and, and then respond but always listen to understand don't listen to respond yeah i think that that leads really nicely into my next question which is um and, and I wanted to touch on, you've used the word othered quite a lot. And I think it's really important to understand where that comes from. So the question I was going to ask is that I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, we've gone PC mad. Why is it, why is it so important that we use the correct terminology? And, and to remember as well that the terminology that we use is fluid. But I think this ties in really nicely to the word that you've used othered quite a lot and why mm -hmm. the correct terminology is important in that context. I think it's important because it's people's identity. It's very personal. It makes up who individuals are. And I don't think there's any, um, I, don't, I don't know why it is such a burden, if I'm, if I'm entirely honest, <laughs> to, uh, to learn the, the way a person would like to be addressed. I mean, I don't, I, 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 I don't know why that's- I, Do you know, I think it's my personal okay. opinion there is that it's just people, people get so attached to routine. Mm -hmm. uh, to things that they're used to this is like this is completely my personal kind of conjecture on the situation and so it's not I think sometimes it's not necessarily I don't want to say that but, but they just get so used to doing one thing that to do something else well why this this works and what they don't always understand necessarily is it works for you it works for you as an individual but it doesn't work for uh, somebody who needs to be identified in a, in a different way and I, yeah, I yeah, I think as well. There is something when they say you know we've kind of gone we we've gone um, to PC. I, I I think it's just respecting people's difference and their identity. Um, and one of the, the the most significant things to do in, as human beings is to respect one another, right? So it's such an important um, part of of someone's identity. And I, I know what you mean. You're absolutely right because it is about routine. It is about oh, it's just a habit. You know, I know lots of people have struggled with pronouns um, and, and that landing and that sticking with with um, uh, with people because they're so used to using the, whichever pronoun that, you know, they would they would use. And but I think there is something in um, I think there is something in trying to learn it and understand the value that it has for the other person. Yeah. Um, and and understanding that while it's e as you say, while it's easier for you to go. A particular way lots of things are easier doesn't make them right so for example um i sit on a number of boards and one of the things that we did we, we created okay i created as, as the inclusion please i created <laughs> i created um how we speak to each other and so i asked everyone around this board to to talk about how they expect to be addressed how they expect to be treated um and then we wrote it down and I, it was in the middle of the route it was the middle of the table um, and then we had little bits that were kind of strip, take, little strips of paper that were in front of us for the, the common mistake we kept making. And the reason we did that was to, to reintroduce new habits so that the old habit would die. Yeah. Um, because the old habit is not how we behave today. It's not making people in this room feel included today. So while it is, yeah, it's hard to kind of um, keep up to date in a way with all the different ways that language is changing, I think it is important to to ask people how how do you identify what is the language that we're using and, and making that clear and just putting it somewhere that constantly reminds you to, to use it so that it's it does challenge the point you make in turn around the routine that we may have on using particular words and and um, particular language. I also think that it was so important to know the why because that's when it sticks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, 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 you know, Simon Sinek says it, maybe not in this context, but always his book, you know, start with why. And I think that's so important. Yeah. Why is your pronoun important to you? Yeah. That's, the, that's why you're offending. Why is, you know, when you use a microaggression, why is that microaggression making my life difficult at work, making me feel excluded? A really good one to ask yourself as well. Why, why is it so important for you to continue using 
the, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this in a yeah. non accusatory way, but why is it yeah. so important for you to keep calling this person he or she when they yeah. have expressed that they want to be called they? Why is it so important to you that this person dresses in a gender that you recognize? Why is it so important to you that you keep using yeah. this? Because how, it, why is it important to you doesn't affect that other person? No. <laughs> how you address them does affect them. Yeah. So absolutely really absolutely and the thing with microaggressions we do a series called the speaking out series where we demonstrate we act out these these um microaggressions and i always say this isn't a lesson in how to get away with <laughs> not getting caught with a micro yeah. you know exhibiting a microaggression this is challenging why you have the microaggression why do you and it's absolutely chill point Linton, why do you want to use it which is why i was saying i don't understand the burden you know, if it's about the routine, we can find ways. We can do. As I said, if you have to, write a sheet in, down every time you have a meeting until it gets into your head that this is the language we use to yeah. um, identify or address particular individuals, for example. It's just, you, you know, it's, that's what you do. If you have to learn something else at work, you would. Yeah. I don't know why it's so difficult to, to when it comes to a human being, and which yeah. is why I say it's so important to respect the identity of other of other human beings and and you're absolutely right it doesn't affect you to change it what yeah. what skin is it off your nose to learn yeah. a new way to but to it does that. have an impact yeah on the on the person who's receiving it which is why i say ask yourself you know start with the why and ask yourself why it's a problem and i think as well what i wanted to touch on is when we talk about other and the language that we use, I think that's a really central thing, especially to do with race and this idea that it's white and everything else. Um, and I, I've always found that a really funny concept because um, in terms of phenotype, there are uh, black people are the most diverse phenotype in the entire world. Um, and yet we still compare it to others. And I think that's where language comes in as a really important thing. Why is it that we can't say this? Why is it that we can't say that? Why? Because I think all, and you can expand on this for me as well, because you'll be able to articulate it a lot better than me, but it's, it's this idea of um, your identity being as comparison to, uh, or, you know, off center from white. Um, it's always comparison to and that's and I think that's another important point to touch on about language um, you know the importance of language is not to feel othered absolutely uh, yeah absolutely um, and you make a really good point the reason why I was using that word othered is because it's always making that there's like there's a priority type of person <laughs> there's this like there's this like the, this their way or whoever that they is for example is is the is the prior is the is the main thing is the I don't want to use the word majority I'm trying to really avoid using the word majority because of what that then it takes my debate in a it different centralizes it though yeah so it's that idea that like because a majority do things in a particular way that is the way that it that it should be so it doesn't allow for individual individuality and individual identity right an individual representation and so the reason why i say other oh, is the moment they ask for their individual representation it's yeah. eye rolling and oh, you know why can't they just yes yeah. you know, why, why why have we all of a sudden got to learn this and that's what i mean by you other them like you make them less important they're less significant why can't they just fit in why can't they just go along with the majority and yeah. and, and, and i always structural central whiteness yeah, essentially. It's a structural, I, as I said, not an individual thing. It's a structural thing. Whiteness is the central. Yeah, and, the and, and the place of which everything else has to has to start from, right? Yeah. And so, and, and then and that's a bit that, that I, I, I have a challenge with that when I talk about being othered, I always think, what gives you the right? Why is your experience more valuable than mine? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. If we're both human beings, who's told Fully you? Fully valid. <laughs> Who's told you that your human experience is more relevant, um, important, significant, valuable than mine? Yeah. And so that's what I mean by don't other me. There's not, there's not, there's not the like the cool kids and then the others. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or the it, it, like, and I don't even want to do that because that almost trivialised it. But there's not the the majority, the majority, the centralised, and then everybody else is others. No, we're all one human race, and unfortunately, because of systems. <laughs> and systemic um, structures, you've made it that there's this 
there's this priority group, there's this majority group, and, and that's what I mean by when we other. No, if we're all if we're all human beings, that shouldn't be happening where we're where we're dictating, you know, whose values and views um are more important than others. And that's where that privilege piece plays back into uh, systems and structures. Real. Well, this has been absolutely amazing, so insightful. Um, I hope it's helpful <laughs> for everybody. Thanks so much, Joanna. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. And thank yeah. you for helping to <laughs> condense my rambles. <laughs>